Spirit, Jesus, we worship you. And we praise you for the family of God. We praise you for the love of the Lord Jesus that puts it in our heart to care about one another. Lord God, thank you tonight for this service. Thank you tonight for the joy of the Lord. Thank you tonight for the gathering of the saints. And we worship you, Lord. Stir us up, Lord God. Stir us up to praise you and to give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's sing tonight as the brother comes to lead. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he to put that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I
slain, but the day we enter glory. Jesus, the day we see you face to face. Jesus, the day we look at you and we're there with an innumerable company of angels up in glory. There's something to shout about tonight. The promise of going to heaven. Jesus, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for hope. Thank you, God, for faith. Thank you, God, for the bright future. Thank you, God Almighty, for how wonderful everything is in Jesus' name. Jesus, hallelujah. Yes, give him glory. Give him glory. Give him a great big round of applause. And praise him and give him glory tonight. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Don't stop. Don't stop. Just praise him. Don't stop praising the name of the Lord. Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, God. Grace God. You may be seated. It's wonderful tonight. Why don't ushers come at this time? And let's receive the Thursday night offering and tithe. And, and if that kills your spirit, that's good. Because we're after that. What are you talking about? The Lord loveth a cheerful giver. And we do our part as unto the Lord because we love him. This opportunity to give is just a blessed thing, and so we do it as unto the Lord. So just give from your heart and let God lead you. Pay your tithe, give in the offering. God's got a blessing for you, brother, if you'll pray. has said who is this king of glory the lord almighty the long the lord who's strong and mighty in power we can praise the name of the lord god almighty amen
Amen. Praise God. I was telling them the other night in class. In class, we've been talking about this. You too, if you're a Christian, shall reign forevermore. Amen. If you know the Bible, you know that's true. Hallelujah. With Jesus. Amen. This bunch just thinks they run things. But I know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. You may be seated. I'm reading to you tonight from Exodus chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Outersites. Now, therefore... <laughs> Behold, the cry of the children of Israel is to come unto, is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And I want to use as a text to preach from tonight, verse 9. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Let us pray. Pastor Kinsler, sir, pray if you would. Amen. Amen. Preaching to you about, sorry, I think my monitor died. Okay. Lip service. I thought this was a Thursday evening service. <laughs> it is. Now, therefore, behold the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. This was a conversation between God and Moses, the deliverer of Israel. Interesting how God's people, Israel, called out to God for help in their distress. And God told Moses, I heard their cry. And I'm sending you to lead them out. God heard their cries for help and brought them out of their slavery and their misery. But the cry from Egypt was only lip service. Before they even, before they even got across the Red Sea good, I'll wait till she's done so that what do you need, sister? Everybody's looking at you, so I'll just wait. Do you need him to go check on kids or something? Okay. All right. So when you're preaching and all the heads go, you know they're not listening. And if there's one thing a preacher can't stand, is when people don't listen. <laughs> do you need to take care of something? Uh, 
I'm not trying to embarrass you. I just want you to. Well, go ahead, whatever. They're not going to listen anyway. That's what Pastor Davis used to say. He used to say, do what you want to do. That's what you're going to do anyway. You don't like that either, right? Okay. Well, find something you like and latch on to that tonight, whatever it is. The cry from Egypt was only lip service before they even got across the Red Sea. They weren't even crossing yet. They were to the Red Sea. They were already complaining. And this is what they said in Exodus 14.10. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said to Moses, here they are crying out to the Lord again, but notice the difference. Because there were no graves in Egypt, you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Quite different than the prayers they were praying when they asked God to get them out of their problem. He said, is not this the word we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? That is not what they were praying when they were in Egypt. In fact, it was all about them not wanting to serve the Egyptians because it was cruel torture. They said, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. They're complaining to Moses, which is proof that all their prayers in their misery in Egypt was nothing but lip service. As soon as they got opportunity under adversity, They changed their tune quickly and became complainers. They had no real sincerity in their prayers to God from their slavery. They just wanted a fire escape. It was the cry of hypocrisy. Like Israel, many today offer God only lip service. They cry out when they're desperate. They shed tears, but they quickly forget. This is because they only pray to get out of trouble. The rest of the time, you'll not find them praying. It's like a lot of Christians, too, who prayed to get saved after God saved them and didn't pray much after that. Prayer became a thing of the past instead of a past time. And so they know that God requires them to serve him, but they refuse to serve him. And even when people are desperate, they cry out to God, but they do not intend to change. They never quite get saved. In the hospital, on a deathbed, they'll call out unto the Lord. If they think their life is over, they'll call out unto the Lord. If a loved one is dying and they don't want them to die, they'll cry, these people will cry for the, of the loved one, and they'll pray and ask God to spare their lives, and I know this by experience, because I did it a couple times myself. You cry out to the Lord, save them. If you'll have mercy on them, Lord, I will do this and do that. I'll serve you. I'll give you my life. And then they don't do it. It was nothing more than lip service. Lip service is a cliche from many years ago, and it means just saying words that you don't really mean. You give somebody lip service and say what you think they want to hear you say, but you have no intention of doing what you say. It was a cry of hypocrisy. They were certainly oppressed. They were absolutely miserable, but they didn't mean what they said. They wanted God to get them out of it, but when he did, they had no more need for God. A lot of people today, they won't get saved because they don't have any need for God, so they think. They think they don't need God, and we all need God. God's attitude toward this lip service was shown in Isaiah, the prophet, chapter 1, At verse 10, he began and he said, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, and give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Now this was not 
Sodom and Gomorrah. He was talking to Israel, and this is the prophet Isaiah. This is long after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he was talking to them and referring to them as if they were somehow like Sodom and Gomorrah in that they were wicked, idolatrous, and had departed from their God. And he said, listen to me, O Sodom and Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Who required you to come into the house of the Lord? He said, Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. So that means you got to go home and get rid of your incense, right? Only if you're covering up marijuana smoke with it. They keep the incense, get rid of the marijuana. But it's an abomination unto me. Oh, you thought I didn't know about that trick, huh? Okay, cool. There was a monster years ago, who used to use incense. Never heard of frankincense? <laughs> eh, whatever. Guess, I guess not. <laughs> but in the priestly officiation, they would use incense to create a, a smoke in that holiest place to shield from the glory of God when God would visit there and not so it would not burn the priest alive and they offered incense and incense is as the revelation said the prayers of the saints that's why we sing that one choir song it said let our incense rise it's thinking about this Old Testament practice which is a type of the way that prayer ascends before God. There's a whole long teaching about it I don't want to get into right now, but he said to them about that which should have been incense pleasing to the nostrils of God and should have been something that God was speaking favorably of. But instead he said, I hate your incense. When you come to appear before me, who has required to set your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, waste of time offerings. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool or cleansed white like white wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. History shows that they chose the latter. They refused, they rebelled, and enemies overran their land and destroyed their entire nation. 
All because they would not listen. And here God was saying to them that when you come into my house, I didn't require you to do that. You're supposed to be here because you want to be. I didn't demand that or force you to come into the house of God. And he said, when you do and you spread forth your hands and you make your offerings and all this, because you are wicked and because it is the cry of hypocrisy, I can't stand it. God told him, you take it, I don't want it, I hate what you're doing because you're doing it in hypocrisy. Didn't the Bible say, I will, that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands? Holy hands, without wrath. Without the wrath of God upon you, without doubting, in faith, you raise up your hands. Not just doing it because you're in a service or because you want to fit in with everybody else. But it was lip service. The, res the solution was, why don't you let me wash you and make you clean? If you can be clean, then you can really raise your hands. I contend it over and over and over, and people don't like it. They get upset with me. They criticize me. They do whatever. I'm a big boy. I got my big boy panties on, so I can take it. It's all right. They don't mean anything by it. But they don't like it when you say, if you can't raise your hands to God, you're not saved. Something's wrong in your heart if you never worship God, you never pray, you never talk with God. When you're in the house of God, you are detached and remote and distant. You slip in at the last minute and slip out at the first minute. Why aren't you late leaving church? No one's ever late leaving church. Man, they're out the door. I've got to beat everybody in the parking lot. Why? If you hang around in fellowship, all it will be cleared out and you'll have a clear pathway all the way home. So if that's what it's all about, all you got to do is wait it out. You don't have to be the first one to fly out the gate and hit the neighbor's goat. Just why don't you want to be around the saints of God? What's wrong with you that you don't want to worship your God that you say you have? But don't worship him in hypocrisy. Do what is suggested here. Let me go to the Lord and be clean. He said, no matter how dirty you are, I can clean you up. No matter how filthy the stain of sin, I can wash it away. He said, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the fat of the land. You'll have everything you need. I will bless you. I will supply for you. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured with the sword. And so I think the first one is the best choice. I would much rather be feasting on a big fat steak than have a sword chopping me my head off, wouldn't you? It's two choices. Two choices. Let's look for a minute now then. What's the two choices, preacher? Be willing and obedient, eat the good, or refuse and rebel and be devoured. Let something eat you instead. The cry of hunger and thirst. You know, there's nothing like the cry of a hungry child in the night. When that baby comes awake at three in the morning, I don't know why those things have to eat all night. Maybe because it's recommended that you eat a lot of small meals instead of one or three big ones every day. So they like to have a snack every couple hours and they cry out in the night. But moms are attuned to that. God puts something in the moms. Hallelujah. Where they just know. They just know the cry. It has a different tone. It has a different timbre to it. And they know the cry of that hungry child in the night. And they'll bump dad and say, baby's hungry. Go get him. So he has to go. Go get him and bring him in there. Because contrary to popular belief, uh, dad doesn't have anything that the baby really wants. It's mom that he wants. He wants mom to tend to his needs. Now, dad can try, but baby will be frustrated because there's nothing there. He has nothing. <laughs> He's like the dry riverbed. But mom, 
has the sweet cream of life. She has what he needs. And he latches on, and it's so good, and he's so satisfied, and then he rolls back to sleep. If it's a boy, that's what men do, so that's what boys do. And they, just, uh, they just roll back to sleep, and he's satisfied. It's the cry of hunger. It's different. The cry of hunger and thirst is unlike any other. And Jesus said this in his great sermon on the mount. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Notice he didn't say that they hunger after worldly possessions or that they hunger after anything earthly. He said the ones that are blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. What is righteousness? Doing right, being right, being right with God, doing things that are right with God, doing unto others the things that are right unto others and unto God, just a life of righteousness, right things. That's what it is. And when you hunger and thirst for that, it means you got the right motive. I want to do what's right, preacher. I want to do the right thing by my brother and the right thing by my sister. I want to do right by God. I want to do right by my family and right by my friends. We don't want to do anything evil or wrong or in any way that defrauds or takes advantage of. That's why God said keeping the law is done by love because love does no ill to its neighbor. If someone does ill to its neighbor and everybody's your neighbor, then you say you have love, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. You can't do wickedness to somebody and then say you love them. It's a lie. Men who love their wives don't slap them around. They don't neglect them. They don't despise them. They treat them like a lady. They take care of them. They honor them like the Bible teaches them to do. Seeking God should not be just to seek God, but it should be because we want him. Jesus met the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And she came and Jesus said to her, give me something to drink. He's just sitting there waiting for her. He knew she was coming because he'd already told the disciples, I need to go through Samaria. And he went there to encounter this woman. And when she came with her water pot and she was going to get water from the well, he said, give me some to drink. And she said, why do you ask me? You're a Jew, and I'm just a woman of Samaria. We don't have anything to do with each other. Why are you asking me for something to drink? He said, lady, if you knew who was asking you, if you knew that the water of life is standing here in front of you, and I give more life than what's in that well, you wouldn't be saying that. He said, give me to drink. He said, how did you ask? He said, if thou knowest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So the woman said, you don't have anything to draw with. The well is deep. And where did you get this living water? That's verse 11. Are you greater than Jacob who gave us the well and drank thereof himself with his children and his cattle? And Jesus said, whoever drinks of this water in this well is going to get thirsty again. But if I, you get the water that I will give you, the living water, you will never thirst again. What I'm going to give you is going to satisfy you. You see, this is a perfect picture of the unsaved and the saved. They in the world do not hunger after righteousness. It is not in their nature to want the right thing, only in some certain cases. They are thirsty, and they are hungry, and they don't even know what for. So they keep eating this lousy, rotten diet of the devil's food. Every day they eat devil's food cake, deviled eggs, devil this and devil that all devil food that's all they feed on the world sin partying garbage people fair weather friends darkness evil wicked all these things but when I came to God and I did what the psalmist said which was taste and see that the Lord is good when I found out how good he was 
I didn't have any regret of saying goodbye to all of that garbage. It doesn't satisfy. It leaves me discouraged and darkened and weak and depressed. But Jesus lifted me up and he put joy in my heart. He put satisfaction in my life. And I have no regrets today to say he is the light of my life. He is my tower of refuge, my strength, my salvation, my deliverer, my song in the midnight hour. Hallelujah. That's why the psalmist said, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so thirsteth my soul for thee, O God. Amen. Jesus satisfies the hungry soul, but there has to be a cry, a hunger and thirst. And he knows when you have this cry and he knows how to answer and meet the need. On the day of Pentecost, it was a regular day of a feast in Israel. Just a holiday. Barbecues everywhere? I don't know. But it was just a holiday, and they were told to wait and pray and receive a promise that Jesus told them about. A promise from God the Father himself. The Holy Ghost. He said, go and wait. And after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power. If you feel powerless to live for God, this is the answer right here. He said, wait for the power that God promised. So they went to Jerusalem. They gathered in an upper room, and many of them were there praying. These were God-hungry people, and God-hungry people find God every time. It's that simple. If they're hungry for God, they will get to God. And they will only get to God through Jesus Christ because there's no other way to get to God. And anyway, they were, they were empty and they longed to be filled with the goodness of God. Bankrupt, beggar-like, full of fear. They were turned into spiritually rich children of the inheritance of God with boldness who boldly declared the whole counsel of God. They were boldly preaching where no man had gone before. In the face of intellectuals and Greek philosophers and the great minds of the day and preaching things that contradicted their so-called great knowledge and science and intellectual ability, it absolutely flew in the face of all man's theories and all their garbage that they choose to believe in and by simple faith these men found a rich well of springing up everlasting water that saved them and filled them that day they heard the sound like a mighty rushing wind and they were blown away so to speak as the spirit of God came down and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they started speaking in another language not like those hypocrites on TV that's not tongues that's a bunch of charlatans putting on a show but there is a real one and there is a real baptism of the Holy Ghost there is a real fire from heaven and it lit us up and set us aflame for God Amen. It was the beginning of the church of the living God. A praying church. A concerned church that wanted the world to know what they found. A contrite church. If they had failed Jesus miserably and were now humbling themselves and they were a confessing church, they were not judging one another, but they were seeking the face of God. Today, it seems we're too busy to wait and let the power of God come upon us. Amen. It too, we're too busy to seek his face. But Crawley wrote, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Wean it from earth through all its pulses move. Stoop to my weakness, mighty as thou art, and make me love thee as I ought to love. And so Ravenhill wrote, It's sad when the church has swung from the upper room with its fire to the church with the supper room and its smoke. Lastly, there is a cry from hell. As the rich man lift up his eyes in torment. You can come on. Everybody's ready to end this right now. But I'm going to take you down in this story 
it was too late now. The rich man died. He lifted up his eyes in hell, and the time for praying was over. He said, I need just a drop of water to cool my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. The cry from hell rang across the great gulf and over into the ears of those who were the righteous dead, the people of God. And Abraham said, son, you had your good things when you were alive, and now you are tormented. Nobody can come from here to there, and you can't come from there to here. But a preacher told a story because he had it in his mind, and I'll finish with this right here. He had it in his mind that maybe he was wrong was a preacher many years ago. Because people were saying, hell's not literal. Hell's not real. It's not true. It's not real. It was just a figure of speech that was used. But it's not a real place where there's real torment. Sounds like a JW, doesn't it? And there were so many voices saying this that he kind of began to doubt his own belief. He wondered, God, have I, have I gotten it wrong? Is there something I've missed? Help me. Help me to see, Lord. Am I mistaken? In the vision that night, he dreamed a dream. And two giants, he said, led him away. Down, down, down until he got to the lake of fire. And he said he could hear the screaming victims everywhere. And he recognized an old friend in the flames screaming and writhing in torment. And he called out to him, called him by name, said, what are you doing here? He said, I was in an automobile accident two weeks ago and I landed in this awful place. The next day, he went to visit that friend, and his mother answered the door. When he asked for his friend, she just looked pale and said, Haven't you heard? Two weeks ago, he was in an automobile accident, and he died. From that point on, the preacher knew, I'm not mistaken. God is showing me. I'm preaching it right. There is a hell. Amen. Many people will only give God lip service until one day they lift up their eyes in hell, but then it will be too late. I'm telling you tonight, taste and see that the Lord is good. I don't serve God just to avoid hell. Now believe me, trust me, I'm being honest. I do want to avoid hell. I really do, being honest with you. I'm not going to stand up here and act like I don't. Like the one kid told me one time, he said, Oh, we, we don't live for God for the rewards in heaven. He said, So how about, uh, you know, I, I just, that's not why I live for God, because of what I'll get and making it to heaven and all that. I said, All right, right now, standing right here before God on this sidewalk, son, Renounce everything that God has waiting for you. Tell him right now, you don't want it. You don't want heaven. You don't want the rewards of God's inheritance. He said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I said, yeah, it's exactly what I thought. <laughs> so I'm not going to act like I don't want to avoid hell. I definitely do not want to die and go to hell. But that's not why we serve him as much as that we tasted and found that he's really good. And the lives that we have right now may not be as perfect as some would want them, but they sure are a lot better than living without God. The way of the sinner is hard. It doesn't matter how good they may be, their way is still difficult and has all of its penalties and appendages, but the way of God is so much better. Man, when your conscience is clear and your heart is pure and you love people and you want to be around the people of God, it's awesome. It's a great thing. And, and uh, many, I think there are many that aren't with us anymore that know they left something really good behind. They can't even leave us alone. They can't 
can't stop thinking about us and checking on us and seeing what we're doing and who's where and who said what. You know why? Because they know the love we have that bridges all the racial barriers. It reaches out across the national barriers. There aren't any. We are a church of all nations, all people, because that's what God's church is. Every nation from the North Pole to the South Pole and the East Pole to the West Pole. He is the God of all the earth. And I'm so thankful tonight that I tasted and found out are you hungry and thirsty tonight? If you're hungry and thirsty, you can have what you need. It's as simple as a crying out, the cry of hunger and of thirst. Lord, I need something tonight. Lord, I'm bowing the knee before you. I need you to touch me tonight. Lord, I need you to renew the fire burning in my spirit. Renew my love. Renew my dedication over and over and over. God, we cry. How about you? Where are you with it tonight? Call out upon him. God bless you. Let him hear your cry.
still sing one more before we leave tonight. But here's the thing. Have you ever, have you ever felt like, Lord, I don't pray enough. I need to pray more. And days go by and it just seems like you didn't get to it. The thing to do is increase the hunger and thirst factor. Because when you're hungry, you'll find your way to that fridge. You won't do anything else until you get something out of it. If you're not hungry for God tonight, you should be. Because you don't want to lift up your eyes, you know where. I want to lift up my eyes and see Jesus. So you need to let the Spirit of God fall upon you. If you will, you will transform your life. But you have to be willing and obedient. God bless you.
one more time. God bless you. It's a prayer. Weekend service is coming up. Sunday morning, Sunday night. Come hungry and thirsty for something from God. You come expecting, you will not go away empty. Amen. Raise your hunger factor. Pray. Talk to God. When you get hungry for God, I will see you down here praying your heart out. So let's have something like that Sunday morning. It'll be a great time. Tell yourself. Build yourself up. Sunday morning. I'm going to pray harder than I've ever prayed. I'm going down there. And I'm going to show that preacher that I'm not proud and afraid to go down to the front and pray. I'm looking forward to it. God bless you. Welcome, Sister Oliva. Clarissa. She's joining the Graham team for a little while. Fresh out of Florida, no alligators in tow. Hallelujah. And also, what a, I'm glad to have my son in church with us tonight. He's visiting from Austin, Texas for about a week. And uh, what else was it? Something else. Oh, I meant to tell you about Brother Sister Owens. They kind of got away from me. I didn't realize when their departure date was. They didn't just disappear. But they've gone to work with Brother Sister Walls in Madison, Wisconsin. They're already there. You haven't seen the two wild boys running around? That's why. Because they're already there and they're having a good time. So pray for them that they can get established. That God will bless them there. And uh, they're looking for a building. Been trying to get a building there. Instead of sharing, trying to get a building of our own, we're kind of waiting on somebody else's real estate deal to fall through. I'm not wishing them any bad luck. But if their loan doesn't go through, we're going to grab it. We already have dibs on it. It's a nice building. And so it was a JW place. So we'll actually bring the kingdom into the kingdom hall. Make it a real church. So we're looking forward to it. And if God wants us to have it, we will. If he doesn't, on to the next thing. God will provide. So pray about that. God bless you. See you Sunday here in the house of the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. 